Well, growing up, I used to get bullied quite a bit by this older boy. Uh, his parents and my parents were friends, and so we would spend some time together. And usually there was quite a few kids that were around when we would hang out. But for whatever reason, I always got singled out, and this kid would pick on me. And I remember, you know, he would say mean things quite often to me, but I think one of the things that made it tough is that he wasn't just cruel, like, in what he would say to me verbally, but at times he would get physical. I was smaller, and he would, would do things to me, and, and it kind of got frustrating. I remember one time I had one uh, vivid memory of a time where we were uh, on a flatbed trailer doing something, just kids playing or whatever, and he knocked me off, and I got the wind knocked out of me. I think that's the first time that ever happened, and that's kind of scary for a kid. So I remember that happening, and I went and told my parents, and often when I would tell my parents about that stuff, they would console me, and they would you know, go to the kids and say, hey, stop all the roughhousing and, and be nice. But my dad knew that this kid was messing with me. And I remember on one particular occasion, we were going to someone's house, and we knew that that family would be there, and then that boy would be there. And on the way to that house, I remember my dad talking to me about the importance of sticking up for myself. Uh, the importance of defending myself, like if, if people did things to me. Now, he was a very peaceful man, not a violent guy at all, but he also, as a dad, wanted to make sure that I had, you know, the, the tools and the tool belt to equip myself to not just get, you know, beat up on all the time. He wanted me to stand up for myself, so he was trying to encourage me to do that. And so on that particular day, we show up to the house, and I decided I was going to stand up for myself if anything happened. And lo and behold, stuff started happening, the kid kind of got a little bit physical, and so I stood up to him. And can you guess what happened next? Yeah, no. I started getting the tar beat on me. That's what happened. I started getting whipped up pretty good. That is what happened. Uh, I don't remember all the details of the altercation. I just remember at one point, though, I got kind of overpowered, and the kid uh, went after like the face, my neck area, and which is kind of scary. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, who swooped in? My dad, like Superman, swooped in, took the kid off me. Uh, I didn't know that he was watching, but apparently from a distance, I think he was wanting to make sure that things were okay. He was watching to see if anything was going on, and he saw when things started to kind of escalate, and he came in, took the kid off me. I don't remember exactly what he said, but it was something to the effect of what's going to happen to this kid if he ever lays a hand on me again, one of those moments, and the kid never messed with me again. Like, that was the end of it. My dad came to the rescue. He saved me, and I will always remember that moment. Now, why am I sharing that story with you this morning? I am sharing this story with you because I think it illustrates something important for us. You see, the truth is we have a Father, a Father in heaven. He is a Father who loves us, a Father who is always watching out for us. And while sometimes it may seem as if the affairs of life, maybe God is distant or absent or indifferent or he's not noticing what's happening, the truth is God is not passive, he's not indifferent, no, he is a God who cares. He is a God who watches. He is a God who knows. And he is a God who does not just sit back forever idly while his children are taking a beating. No, he is a God who intervenes. He is a God of action. He's a God of action. A father who intervenes on behalf of his children to save and to protect. And we're going to see that this morning. So if you want to see it for yourselves, I want to invite you to open your Bibles with me to the book of Nahum this morning. The book of Nahum. Now, uh, as you're turning there, just a reminder, my name is Joseph, I'm the lead pastor here, I'm glad that you're here this morning. If you're like, hey, I have no idea where the book of Nahum is or what this book is, join the club. Well, many people don't, not a very popular book, uh, but if you came here and brought your Bible, you can, you can try to find it, and I'll help you in just a moment, or you can use a seatback Bible, if you didn't bring your Bible, if you don't own a Bible, you can take our Bible song with you today, just take one and we'd love for you to have it. But the book of Nahum is found in a section of scripture called the Minor Prophets. So if you work your way about three quarters of the way through your Bible, you'll get to the Minor Prophets. Right before that is what's called the Major Prophets. They're just longer prophetic books, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, and then you'll hit Hosea. It's the first book of the Minor Prophets. And then you go to Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, and Nahum. If you hit Habakkuk, go backward. Nahum is where we're at this morning. And we happen to be in Nahum because we're working through the dusty portions of your Bible. Let's be honest, people. Many of you, you probably like to occasionally read your Bible. Maybe you've made a habit of doing it every day. I'm willing to bet, though, that most of you don't wake up in the morning and go, you know what, I really want to read my Bible today. Let me start reading the Minor Prophets. Nobody says that. Nobody does that because the Minor Prophets are difficult to understand. They're dark. Um, and so for, for many different reasons, people tend to skip these, but we have a goal this summer. 
We want to clear out the dust from the Middle Hebrew Bibles by working through a series we're calling Majoring on the Minor. So every single Sunday, we take a 30,000-foot view, kind of major on that minor prophet of that, that week, and work our way through all the minor prophets. So by the time summer is over, all the dust is clear from your Bible. So if you guys are ready to unpack the book of Nahum with me, I have, I've got my Bible here. Are you guys ready to clear out the dust? All right. Let's do this together. Ready? All right. The book of Nahum. Let's jump in. So, the book of Nahum is three short chapters, and it's a collection of prophetic writings that was written by a prophet named Nahum, who lived in the southern kingdom of Israel, and he specifically made this prophecy about a people group, the people of Assyria, and he spoke directly about the capital city of Assyria, a city called Nineveh. Notice how the book begins, starting with verse 1, it says this, an oracle concerning Nineveh. It says, the book, the vision of Nahum of Elkosh. Now, we don't really know much else about Nahum himself, but if you remember, a few weeks ago, we should know something about the, the city of Nineveh, because if you were with us in the book of Jonah, that book is all about the city of Nineveh. Remember, Jonah was a prophet that got raised up. It was uh, written about 100 years before this was written. And uh, Jonah ended up being told he was to go to Nineveh and deliver a message of judgment because of the wickedness of the city had risen up to God. And so when Jonah got this command, he decided to go the opposite direction. He did not want to listen to God, and he did not want to go to Nineveh. But God, through a series of circumstances, had him go to Nineveh. And then he finally went there, and he preached this message to the people of Nineveh that if they did not repent, if they did not turn from their sin, that God would judge them. And lo and behold, they repented, and God did not bring destruction on the city. And this book taught us that when the people <clears throat> repent, God will relent. And that's what happened in the book of Jonah. However, we can't stop the story there. You see, the truth is, the story continues in history. As I mentioned, this was about 100 years after Jonah. But what happened in the biblical story is only a few decades after the people of Nineveh repented in the story of Jonah, they started turning back to their old ways. In fact, in the year 722 B.C., uh, the historical records tell us that the people of Nineveh and the capital city uh, or the people of Assyria, the capital city of Nineveh, they ended up uh, rising up and invading the kingdom of Israel. And the northern kingdom of Israel in 722 BC was completely destroyed, uprooted, the people were taken, dispersed throughout the empire, and really this Assyrian empire ended up dominating much of the ancient world. So here is on this map of the ancient Near East, the city of Nineveh. This area is Israel, so the northern territory of Israel. This is where they invaded in 722 BC. They established a massive empire that really swept through this whole area, all the way down south into Egypt, and all the way through Babylonia and the kingdom of the Medes. Uh, it was a, a big kingdom, the kingdom of Syria. And what they did after they made that empire and destroyed the city of Israel, or the northern kingdom of Israel, is they started brutalizing all the people, all the nations who they were governing, during this time. And one of the things they continued to do during this time was they would send in raids from Nineveh and from Assyria into the southern kingdom of Judah and begin to attack cities and brutalize God's children. And so what we see in this book is this is a book where Nahum is making a prophecy against the city of Nineveh. Now he is not going to Nineveh because that's not the point. They're going to surely be judged. He's giving the message to these people here that Nineveh is going down. God is going to finally bring about this judgment on this wicked city and all the nations that are being brutalized by, by the people of Assyria, they're going to be um, saved from, from, their, from their attacks. And lo and behold, when Nahum made this prophecy, guess what? God delivered on that promise. God fulfilled that prophecy. In the year 612 BC, there was a coalition of armies from Babylonia and the Medes, and they went north, they attacked the city of Nineveh, and they defeated the city of Nineveh. Nineveh that's 612 BC. And then, well, with the remaining forces that the Assyrians had, they moved further west. They retried to fortify an army to continue their reign. And what ended up happening is, uh, I think it's the year 605 BC, the Battle of Carchemish took place, where the Assyrian forces teamed up with the Egyptians, and the Babylonians and the Medes, they all clashed, and the Assyrian Empire was officially defeated in 605 BC. And so that's what this book is all about. It's a book promoting the judgment that is coming upon the city of Nineveh for their evil. It's predicting that they will be taken out. It's all about judgment. So guess what? There is good news this morning. Once again, 
This morning is all about your favorite topic. It's about judgment this morning. You excited? <laughs> Don't you love a message about judgment? A good old message about judgment. That's where we're at this morning. Once again, however, let me just say this. Caveat is, I think there's going to be more to this message than meets the eye. And Lord willing, we'll see that for ourselves. So, for the remainder of our time, here's how I'm going to frame up the message. Okay, I'm going to take this book of Nahum, I'm going to glean from chapter 1, and I'm going to try to kind of draw out some principles and truths for you to see. Uh, chapter 2 and chapter 3, I'm not really going to touch on those. That's just going to kind of extrapolate on stuff we see in chapter 1. And so to unpack this book, I want to begin by talking about, number 1, the punishment of God. The punishment of God. Now, we looked at the first verse, which uh, kind of helped give us a little context. But now as we jump into the body of this book, I want you to notice the way that God is described, his character is on display in verse 2 of this book as Nahum begins speaking. And notice the way that God is described by Nahum. It says this, The Lord, Yahweh, is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries and keeps wrath for his enemies. Well, sounds fun, doesn't it? That's a, a great verse right there. How many, how many of you is this your life verse? Like your favorite verse in the Bible? No? Nobody? Any of you have like a pillow with this inscribed on it? Or anybody have a grandma that cross-stitched this verse and like put a nice thing for your wall? Nobody? Yeah, I thought not. This is not a verse that we tend to like very much. We don't want to focus on verses like this. This is describing the character of God as jealous and avenging and wrathful. Now, I don't know about you, but this is not the type of description of God's character that I tend to really think about or enjoy. Right? We're not really comfortable with verses like this. We would rather hear a, like a, a cuddly, soft, happy verse about God, right? about how he's loving and merciful and gracious. We don't want to talk about his jealousy and the way that he brings out vengeance and his wrath. We don't want to hear about that. So why am I talking about this, that this morning? Well, let me start by saying it's in the Bible. Uh, if it's in the Bible, we should probably at least first acknowledge that it's there and accept the reality that this is a depiction of God's character. Now, it's not the totality of God's character. We're going to fill in some of those other gaps later. But this is part of God's character. So first of all, we just have to acknowledge it and accept it. It's in our Bible. So we should accept that. But secondly, and I think this is key, we also have to realize that verses like this are positioned in the Bible and should be understood or interpreted contextually. This is very important. You know me, I love to talk about context. This has been beat in me since, for many years, I was one of my first Bible professors, my theology professor. He always used to talk about how we're not supposed to read into Scripture, we read out of Scripture. If we take our subjective ideas and thoughts and views and our frame of reference and we impose it on the text, we change the meaning of the text. But if we take the text at face value and we interpret from the text and then apply it to our lives, then we're reading out of Scripture rightly. And so we should have context to read Scripture rightly and understand what's going on. And the context of this specific verse is very important. This verse is mentioned within the context of the fact that the people of Nineveh have been brutalizing others for years. In particular, God's children, God's son Israel, they've been brutalizing them. I mentioned a couple weeks ago, I'm going to give you a little more detail, but the people of Assyria and Nineveh were known for skinning people alive. That's one of the things they were known for in the ancient world. If you were to go to, um, to England right now, and you were to look at uh, in the British Museum, the Lachish Reliefs, you would see depictions of this. Uh, the city of Lachish is in the southern kingdom of Judah, and during this time, they would send raids in, and this was depicted when this took place. And so what you see in the depictions are they took prisoners from the city. They brought them to the, to the town square. They had a crowd gather around to watch. And then they would skin people alive slowly and keep them alive and, and, and allow people to watch their suffering. In fact, this is how bad it got. Uh, the people of Nineveh and Assyria, they used human skin to help cover the tents of their soldiers. Like That's how brutal these people were. There are depictions of people being put on wooden stakes, impaled, so others could watch and be horrified at just how brutal they were. There's uh, stories of them taking people and hanging over them over their city walls once they die to intimidate their enemies. Uh, there are depictions throughout history of, of these people in Nineveh and Assyria uh, mutilating people as an intimidation tactic, you know, cutting off noses, ears, gouging out eyes, stuff like that. This is what they did. This is what they did for over a century. They were brutal 
wicked people. They were evil. And again, their evil was often projected toward the children of God. So what is God supposed to do in the face of this kind of brutality? Just sit back and watch as his children, watch as his son, his beloved son, is getting his tail whooped and do nothing? No. That is not what God should do. God shouldn't do that because God is a God of justice. God is a God who does what is right. He must respond to brutality. Listen, God's love doesn't nullify his ability to also exact judgment. It demands that he exacts judgment in the face of evil. I talk about this often, but here in the West, we have this vantage point that if God is a God who judges, he must be bad. That is a very coddled, cushy perspective from a Western worldview of people who never experience injustice at least on the scale of other people around the world. Uh, the reality is we ask the question in the West, well, how could a loving God judge people? A better question is, how could a loving God, loving God not judge people? Like, what kind of loving God would stand back and watch injustice happen and do nothing? That's not a loving God at all. God's love demands God's justice. And in verse 6, uh, we see uh, that, that God's mindset when he sees injustice is that he... He's indignant about it. Notice what it says in verse 6. Who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the heat of his anger? See, injustice is something that makes God angry. And his anger is not bad. It's good. It's a good response. It is righteous indignation. Have you ever seen um, like someone abuse a child or, or hear about it, for example? I worked for years with abused and neglected kids. It was my career before I came here. And when I would hear stories about things that people would do to innocent children, or I'd read case files about it, or, or hear testimony in court, it would make me really upset. I would be angry. That's not a bad response. That's the correct response. There are things in the world that should take us off. Anger is not always bad. This is why scripture says, in your anger, do not sin, which would suggest to us that there is a type of anger that is justified, that is righteous. And every time God is angry, it's always justified. He is described for us in scripture as one who often burns with anger. Now, in Hebrew, the word anger that's used here, it's literally this word that uh, means nostril or nose. Uh, and, and I think it probably derives from the idea of if you ever get really angry, what happens? Your nostrils flare up, right? And your kind of face gets red, your nose gets red. And in Hebrew, they took that emotion that's, that's very vivid in the face, and they kind of embedded it in the language. That, that to have anger is to be, to have, or if you're really angry, it's to be hot of your nose. That's the idea here. And so when we see this passage, who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the heat of his anger here? Literally, in Hebrew, this means, who can endure God's hot nose? That's what it means. Literally. You see, because of all the evil that Assyria has done, God is angry. He has every right to be angry, and judgment is coming. This is where the book of Nahum begins. This is why we start with number one, the judgment, or the punishment of God. The punishment of God. God has every right to exact justice and judgment on those who are evil. And that includes Nineveh. Now, the question we move into is we have to ask, well, is God able to actually do something about this? Well, that leads us to point two, right? the power of God, the power of God. In verse three of this book, Nahum describes the Lord, Yahweh, by saying this, that God, Yahweh, is great in power. He's great in power. Now, this is important to remember, that Israel, their God, the one true God, he is the one who reigns supreme over everything. Right? You read the beginning of your Bibles, God is the one who created everything. With a word, he put everything into motion. And God is also the one who sustains everything in the universe. He is the chief, supreme God. He is sovereign. He rules and reigns. However, if you were somebody who lived in Assyria, you would not recognize Israel's God as the chief, supreme God. In fact, if you were from Assyria, you would worship a pantheon, a plethora of gods with a lowercase g. Now, they had one chief god, his name was Ashur, but they also had significant other gods uh, throughout the Assyrian uh, religion. Uh, they believed, for example, the god Enlil was the, the storm god, the god Enki was the water god, Hadad was the god of agriculture, and a host of other gods with a lowercase g. That's what they believed. And so from their vantage point, if you look at the cosmos, 
There are different realms that have different rulers, different gods that are ruling over them and governing them, and they're all in charge, they're all powerful. However, when we see Nahum begin to talk, he begins to talk about how the God of Israel, no, he rules over all realms. Notice how subtle this is, but it's pretty cool when you understand the backstory. Notice what it says as we pick up in this passage. Speaking of Yahweh, the one true God, his way is in whirlwind and storm. And the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. He dries up all the rivers. Bashan and Carmel wither. The bloom of Lebanon withers. The mountains quake before him. The hills melt. The earth heaves before him. And the world and all who dwell in it. Notice how Yahweh is the one who's over everything. You see what he's doing here? This is a polemic against Assyria's gods. Essentially, Nahum is, is making fun of their false gods and saying that, no, if you think they have power, they don't. Yahweh is the one with power. He suddenly describes all these different realms, right? The storms, the clouds, the seas, the crops, the mountains. Yahweh is the one who has authority over all of those realms, not the gods of Assyria. It all belongs to him. And so the point here is if Nineveh thinks they're powerful, and if they think that they have power that was given to them by their gods, they're wrong. They don't have supreme power. Only Israel's God has the power because he is the one who governs everything. He has no rival, he has no equal, and he reigns Supreme. In fact, Nahum gets explicit. Notice what he says to the Assyrians. He goes on to say, Thus says the Lord, though they're at full strength and many, they will be cut down and pass away. And then he shifts and begins talking to God's people. Though I have afflicted you, I will afflict you no more. And now I will break his yoke from off you, and will burst your bonds apart. And then he goes on to talk again to the people of Assyria. The Lord has given a commandment about you. No more shall your name be perpetuated from the house of your gods. I will cut off the carved image and the metal image. I will make your grave, for you are vile. So what we see here is that Nahum is explicit that God's judgment is coming on Nineveh, on Assyria, because God is all-powerful, not the gods of Assyria, and not that empire. God is the one with all the power. So we, we begin by seeing the punishment of God. And then we begin by moving from there to the power of God. But here's the thing. I want to pause for a moment. Because at this point in the message, we've had a, a picture of God that's a little bit scary. Right? That God is uh, vengeful, wrathful, all-powerful. If we only ever talk about those attributes of God and we never talk about the other attributes of God, we have a very imbalanced view of God. And sort of fill in some of those gaps. I want to now move to another thing that we see very clearly in this book. Number three, I want to talk about the patience of God. The patience of God. As we continue working through the book, we need to remind ourselves of this aspect of God's character. While it is true that he's a God of justice, while he will bring judgment, while he is angry, and while he is powerful, we also know that God is someone who does not have a short fuse. He doesn't. Not at all. God never flies off the handle. God never quickly reacts to something in a fit of rage and, and does something he shouldn't. That is not how God acts. In his anger, he is always measured, and he is always in control. Notice what Nahum says about God in verse 3. It says this, the Lord is slow to anger. Now, we heard this description of God in the book of Jonah. We hear this description of God all over the Bible, that God is slow to anger. You want to know what this is in Hebrew? Literally, it's that the Lord has a long nose. So it says in Hebrew, literally. So if the word nose is angry, and a, a short nose is somebody who flies off the handle, someone with a long nose is somebody who is slow to anger. That's the point. It takes a really long time for God to heat up. And why is this important for us to understand that God has a long nose and is slow to anger? It's because God does this so that his people and other people have an opportunity to turn things around. Isn't that incredible? God is slow to anger because he wants to give people ample time to repent. We have a long-suffering God toward people. And honestly, the, the Ninevites, of all people, they should realize this. Why? Because a hundred years earlier, God was going to bring judgment on them. They deserved it. They were ripe for judgment, and yet what did God do? He sent Jonah to warn them, and when the people repented, God said, okay, I'll spare you the wrath that you deserve, because I'm long-suffering. See, then a hundred years later, the people continue in their wicked ways, and so what God does is he gives them what they deserve. They have all people, that they were given a chance, and they didn't take it ultimately. 
But because God is merciful and gracious and slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, he always gives people a chance to turn around. And if you think about that, that's just awesome, isn't it? That God's default, his natural inclination is not just to drop the hammer on people, it is to wait, be patient, give them the chance to do what is right before he brings the judgment. Right? God is so merciful and gracious. He is slow to anger. And I'm thankful for that. Aren't you thankful for that? This is the character of our God. I know he's slow to anger toward me. He's been gracious and merciful to me. I certainly do not deserve anything good that I've received in life. I deserve judgment. But God has been patient with me, and I praise him for that. This last week, I had a buddy who uh, came into town from Scottsdale. I went to high school with him, and another friend of mine uh, reached out to, to, to us and said, hey, we should all go get, get dinner somewhere. And so, you know, it's kind of cool, because these, these days, like, I'm, I'm 40, and, you know, I don't... I don't really like hang out with friends from high school anymore, but like it's cool, like they're still friends of mine. So this was kind of a cool experience. So I was like, you know what? I think I'm gonna go do that. Let's go hang out. And so I told my family, hey, I'm gonna go hang out with some friends. And my daughter responded by saying, You have friends? Which you know, anybody says the guests have friends. But either way, so we go and we begin talking. We do what 40 year olds do, right? We can begin to reminisce about old times. And my buddies are bringing up all these examples of times when I was in high school and stuff. And I was an idiot. Like, I was bad. I was a knucklehead, like, big time. And they're reminding me of examples of really how stupid I was. And as they're talking, right, it was reminding me about, like, man, like, I, like someone like me doesn't deserve anything good. Right? I'm so thankful that God was patient toward me, that he's gracious toward me, that he's merciful to me. And you know what? The other thing that's tough about that is I'm not patient toward other people. I'm really not. It's funny, I am the recipient of so much grace and so much mercy and so much patience, and I often don't reflect it to the world around me. Isn't that sad? Uh, I, I struggle at times with this. Ask, ask my kiddos, you know, after 8.30 p.m., like, I am not the most patient person, right? If we've sat in bed and cuddled and read and I've got you 17 cups of water by 8.30 p.m., I'm about done. I've got a short nose, right? With fuse at that point. God always has a long nose. He is slow to anger. He is patient toward you and toward me, and that is good news. It's important to understand this about the character of God. So now that we've seen that, we begin to balance this picture of God out, right? We've seen the punishment of God, number one. That he is a God of justice who will judge rightly. Number two, we've seen the power of God. He can carry out. He doesn't make empty promises about what he'll do. He'll actually deal with it. That's number two. Number three, we just saw this, right? The patience of God. That we have a God, though, at the same time, who is patient. He is slow to anger. He has a long nose. He's not going to fly off the handle. He's going to patiently endure um, many of the silliness of all of us. But finally, and, and fourthly, we're going to look at point four. It's the protection of God. As we wrap up, we want to look at the protection of God. Nahum wraps up this chapter, and he gives a message of encouragement to the people of Judah. Remember, this book is for the people of Judah. It's not for the people of Nineveh. It's for the people of Judah to reassure them that even though they're getting their teeth kicked in by this big, bad bully to the Northwest, God has a plan for this. And God has, has a plan, a message of hope for his children and for his son. Notice what God says, or what, what uh, Nahum says about God. Behold upon the mountains, the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace. Keep your feasts, O Judah. Fulfill your vows, for never again shall the worthless pass through you. He is utterly cut off. Now, in this passage, Nahum begins to describe a messenger. Remember, in the ancient world, there's no Twitter, there's no internet, right? News doesn't travel really quickly. News travels slowly. There's a message that's written. It's given to a courier. That courier travels long distances. They bring it to a herald, and a herald proclaims it to the people. And so we see somebody with a message moving across the mountains, and they've got a message of good news. They're publishing peace with this message. And so what's this message? The message that is that Nineveh is going to be destroyed. The bully is going to be defeated. And this is why Nahum tells the people of Judah, hey guys, you can keep your feasts. You can keep going with that. Hey, you can fulfill your vows. right? You can continue to live and prosper because that bully, that bully is going to be defeated. He is done for. The Lord will protect you. In fact, for the rest of the book, chapter 2 and chapter 3, all it does is depict exactly this judgment that God will surely bring upon Nineveh. Why? 
Because that's what a loving father does. A loving father protects his children. He protects his son. As I mentioned earlier in this message, so often we view this idea of God's judgment and we think that that makes God somehow mean or unloving. That is not true. I told the story at the beginning of the message of what my father did. If I told that story differently and I said, yep, and then this bully started beating me up and I saw my dad from the distance, he was watching, and then this kid just started beating the tar out of me. My dad just watched. He was just sitting like this watching as I was getting beat up. If I were beginning to describe that happening, you would be like, oh boy, I don't really know if your, your dad's a really good dad. Just let me get beat up. Like, that's not, that's not what a good father would do. A good father would protect his children, right? That's the point. That's the book of Nahum. God's not going to sit back and let his people take a beating forever. No, he will protect them. He will defend them. He's going to intervene. He's going to stop evil. In fact, this is the big idea of the book of, of Nahum. Evil doesn't win. It does not prevail. It will not prevail. It doesn't. God won't sit back forever. No, he's a God of action. He will intervene on behalf of his children. And you would be saying right now, well, hey, I don't know, Pastor Joe. There's a lot of evil right now, a lot of things I'm going through right now. I don't know if I believe this is true. Well, let me give you real quick an explanation of what I think are the two biggest bullies that exist in the universe. You ready for this? I'm not going to talk about politics right now, by the way. I'm not going to talk about a number of other things that maybe you think. Two things I want to talk about. The bully of sin, which constantly, constantly drags us down. You realize that sin is such a bully, that sin is the thing that keeps us from the Father. You realize that, don't you? Sin is what condemns us. We're condemned because of the bully of sin. In fact, it enslaves us. And we can do nothing of our own strength to break the bonds of this bully. That's the first one. There's another bully in the world. It's called death. Death is the thing that we all have to face one day. It's the reality that we're mortal. And for us, when we think about these two things, these bullies of sin and death, in the face of such evil, which by the way, death is evil. It is the enemy, Scripture says. It's not good, it's bad. In the face of these two bullies, what did God do? Did he sit back and just let these two bullies continue to do their work? No. He stepped into history. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those who were under the law. God sent Jesus, fully God and fully man, who perfectly obeyed every commandment of Scripture, right? He, he completely lived the life that we could never live. He died the death that we deserved. He stepped into our existence, the history. And what did Jesus do? He suffered and bled and died on the cross. Now, the enemy may have thought that when Jesus was crucified that he was defeated, but that's actually the opposite of what happened. At the crucifixion of Jesus, guess what was defeated? The bully of sin. It was stripped of its power. And those who follow Jesus, the one who was crucified on our behalf, we're no longer slaves to sin. It can't hold us down anymore. It doesn't have the power. But guess what about the bully of death? Three days later, what did Jesus do? He didn't stay dead. He rose from the dead, defeating death itself, which is why 1 Corinthians 15 says that death has lost its sting. So praise God, if you think for a moment that he hasn't stepped in to intervene on behalf of the bullies of the world, he has, the bully of sin and death, he has stepped in. And he has rendered those two things powerless. And guess what? When Jesus comes back, those bullies won't even exist. They won't even be on the horizon. Because when he establishes the fullness of his kingdom, there is no more sin and there is no more death. Those things have been completely eradicated. Right now they're rendered powerless, but one day they will be completely eliminated. This is what Jesus has done. So praise God for that. This is why we have a message of good news. The author of Romans borrows from these passages in, in Nahum and Isaiah. He says this, how beautiful are the feet 
of those who preach the good news. That good news is that Jesus has conquered the giant of sin and death on our behalf. As a Christian, I want to implore you this morning to take comfort. Take comfort in this good news. The bullying of sin and death have been stripped of their power. Sin no longer has dominion over you. Death has lost its sting. And Jesus Christ has come. He has come to our rescue. We have a good Father. A good Father who loves us, cares for us, protects us, saves us. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. I thank you for the book of Nahum. Man, so awesome that we can jump into a book like this that is filled with so much difficult language, and yet we see this shining example of your grace and mercy and love. Lord, the reality is we love to even look at uh, examples like Assyria and point our finger and wag our finger at evil, but the truth is the biblical story says that we're all enemies of God man. and yet because we have a God who is slow to anger and gracious and merciful we now can be called children of God we're sons and daughters of the most high God and we can now live with confidence that our father you, Lord, love us. You want to protect us and care for us. We want to thank you for the deliverance you've given in your son, Jesus. Thank you for defeating these bullies of sin and death. So, Lord, I pray that now we would respond by devoting our life to your purposes today, here and now. And in just a moment, we would stand and we would proclaim just the goodness of who you are and what you've done on our behalf. So, Lord, we love you. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name.